are Tyrians. We are many races, several professions. We practice the arts of combat as well as healing. We have foes, and we fight them without mercy. And it's time for us to claim back what is ours. It's time for us to claim back Tyria from the terror of the Elder Dragons. We can't go on living our lives in fear. We have to fight. We have to make a stand. This is our story. Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 43 of the Chronicles of Tyria podcast, a Guild Wars 2 podcast for fans, by fans. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of a heads up uh, for today, I have been very, very sick for about a little bit less than a week uh, at this point since about last Sunday, so... Uh, not feeling the best right now, so, um, probably gonna be a short show, uh, I just, I don't know, I just can't, uh, really wrap my mind around too much stuff, but, uh, anyway, that's not what this is about, this is about Chronicles of Tyria podcast, so, um, as you can see yet again, I am here live from the lag cave by myself, um, and I've been assured by Casey that this will probably be the last time for a while where I will be uh, alone, so we will see how that goes. Um, she said her internet's really slow, so I'll probably have to end up doing all the hosting stuff on my end, because uh, if she were to do it, it would be super, super laggy. Uh, more than it usually was because her internet speed is very, very low right now. Um, but that's another story, so hopefully next week she'll be back and we will be good to go. But, uh, I don't know, we'll see. I will start off right now and just kind of get this out of the way. I'll get the attendance out of the way for people who I recognize here in Twitch TV. Sorry for those of you playing along at home or listening on iTunes, and speaking of iTunes, I'm very sorry uh, for those of you waiting me to release new episodes, I have to do that. I plan to do that this weekend. I, like I said, I've just been sick, so I didn't, I wasn't really up to it. Uh, okay, well, I am up to date. If you guys want to be counted for participation and you're in the Twitch channel, live right now, be sure to speak up so I can uh, make sure I count you guys. I've got everybody that's commented on anything so far, but please speak up uh, or you won't be counted. Uh, Alright, so I will move on then while people wait to figure that out to the question of the week from last week, which I got you Tully, don't worry. Memory burn, I got you too. I'm learning everybody's names if they're different from their in-guild names. Um, so last week's question of the week was where, what do you think we can expect for the next piece of content that's post uh, after the Flame and Frost concludes, which as we know will be on the 30th, the final piece will come out. Uh, okay, Nick. Okay. All right, got him. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? Yes. So that was the question of the week. What do you think we can expect as new content? Uh, and if you recall, for question of the week, I'm offering one gold to the person with the best answer. And if you remember, also our my good buddy Robovin offered to double that amount if I got double the amount of responses that I received last time. Well, I received a whopping zero. Big zero responses for this week. So, Robovin, your gold will be coming back to you uh, shortly. So, after, right after this ends, I will send you that back. 
Um, but, so nobody answered that, but we did have my little game that I had set up for the, uh, you know, what's your age again kind of contest to see who has the most hours. And I only received two. And uh, funny enough, Roovin, you're going to get your gold back, and you're going to get another gold, because, as you can see here, this is Robovin, right here. Uh, there we go. 1,257 hours over the past seven months. So thank you for commenting. Uh, also, the I would like to mention the honorable mention for this, who is Lovegood, who's insane, because I, I feel like it's better to show you than to try to tell you, because look at that. That's 2,969 hours over the past seven months. So under normal circumstances, uh, Lovegood would win, but because he can't respect deadlines, and he sent it to me yesterday, and the deadline was 11:59 uh, p.m. Eastern Time Tuesday. He loses, so wah wah to love good. Uh, but so he doesn't win. But I wanted to mention just to show you because he's insane. And as some of the people here are mentioning in our chat, uh, yes, he does spend a ridiculous amount of time AFK, but logged into the game, which part of me wonders if that's the reason why. Maybe he just keeps himself logged in and goes AFK so he can just brag about how many hours he has. I don't know. It really serves no purpose other than slowly beating up your computer by keeping your it constantly running. But anyway, uh, for those of you who are wondering, I have about a thousand. I got a thousand six. Uh, if we were to start at the beginning, you know, if we were to check over like the first month to th four or five months. My, you know, my hours would have been pretty competitive, but, you know, recently I've been in and out of game a lot, so there you go. Uh, and I see a lot of people posting their hours here in the chat. Well, if you had sent me a screenshot of them, you could have been entered to win. But, Robovin, you will get that. So, uh, there we go. On to the next thing. I didn't receive any mail this week. But I did receive a ridiculous amount of comments from Elmer on one of our YouTube videos, which I'm sure a lot of you remember. It was that Princess Pact video? Uh, and it goes... Actually, you know what? Why don't I just pull it up on YouTube? Because trying to read it, because it's typed out with tons of capitals and question marks and, you know, emoticon-type faces... I doubt I would be able to do it justice. So let's see if I can't. Here we go. Guild Wars 2 Horror Story. Let's see. Where is she? Here we go. So right here. If there was a way I could zoom in, I would. But uh, there you go. Why wasn't I there? How come I only just found out about it? Why haven't anyone told me about this? That would have been an awesome suicidal doll. Can we do it again? Can we please, with lots of ease, kitty eyes at some EU friendly time? Yes, Elmer wants to be cute and kill people. If you wasted all the doll tonics, let's do Quaggin next. So there you go. That was a day ago. So for if those of you are wondering, I'm just going to jump back. Okay. Shut up, Joel. I saw what you said. It's going to get all crazy out of whack here. But boom, Elmer. Lots of... Yeah, there's no way I could do it as if she were writing it, so that's fine. But anyway, uh, why don't I just show you guys the video. It's short, and it'll kill some time. Give me some time to figure out what else I want to talk about. Uh, so yeah, here we go.
Nice. Okay, we got quite a few more people. Mm, yay. To the sacrifice point. Okay, Joe. Lead us. Like disturbing. I can't send any more mail due to, due to excessive messaging. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh. <laughs> Someone send Shaniqua Leroy a tonic. I can't send anymore. <laughs> Shaniqua Leroy. Please. Greatest name ever. Don't hint that we're suiciding, Joel. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Still doing the Someone same thing. Someone send her one? Yep. Yes, please. Because <laughs> we're almost there. Somebody I can't send, send her one. Tonic? I oh, can't. She'll I just jump off as a mentals. human. Yeah, that, that, that would work too, I guess. Wait, 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 wait. Is there one there? Yes. There she is. Alright, good. Let's go. I can see you guys from down here. <laughs> Still funny, but not as funny as the first time we did it. I like how laggy it is. What the fuck? Like, everybody hits the ground and they stand up and die. Giving everyone their daily healer. <laughs> I see more people from feet? the other bomb guild than our guild. Can you hear their feet on the wood? Ready <laughs> 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 jump. Mute my mic. Don't pull Casey. There we go. Uh, yes, so that, for those of you who weren't there, that is the Princess Pact. So, Elmer said that she would like to participate in that and said that she couldn't have been there. So, I mean, yeah, we could do it again. We have a guild meeting this Sunday, which I believe, uh, due to popular... Uh, demand is now going to be moved to 7 p.m. Eastern Time as opposed to 8.30 to accommodate more of our EU friendly players so um, yeah we could do that we could do princess dolls we could pick some other thing uh, as long as it's something that's easy to get and a lot of people have it I'm down so uh, yeah definitely have to do that so thank you Elmer for your very Elmer-esque comment on our YouTube thing. So, um, alright, on to shoutouts. Uh, I'm gonna, again, kind of shout out to Robovin for not only attempting to donate more money to help boost the participation, although it failed, uh, and also for being the winner uh, of the age contest. So, congrats to you, sir. Uh, all right, on to the few things that I wanted to talk about today. Again, I'm sorry, it's probably going to be a short show. I just don't feel uh, and haven't felt up to it. I mean, I, I guess I'll spare you guys the details, but it's been uh, it's been a rough week. 
uh, a lot of sleeping, a lot of not moving at all. So, and as most of you can attest, I haven't really been in game at all all week. So, not a lot of time to do research and things like that. Um, but things I did want to talk about. Uh, we have some interesting news that's come out uh, of ArenaNet lately. Some of the stuff we actually talked about last week, and some stuff I think I talked about like a month ago, maybe. But anyway. Uh, we talked about it last week was the die packs. Remember I had showed everyone the uh, the Reddit or maybe it was on Guild Wars 2 Guru where people had talked about how these Flame and Frost die packs were out or were going to come out and what they all look like and how cool they looked. Um, I don't know if you guys have tried these but I will forewarn you if you buy a Flame and Frost die kit you're Again, it's it's kind of says it in the description there, but just to kind of clarify, you are not guaranteed to get a Flame and Frost die in a Flame and Frost die kit. You only get one die for whatever the price is. Twenty, uh, I think it's 125 gems per kit, I believe. I'd have to double check, but uh, you only get one and you have a kind of a random chance of getting one of the 25 oh, okay here we go uh contains uh has a chance to contain one of uh six new exclusive flame and frost colors so um the die the the colors that you can get like i i bought two and i got a glacial one and then i just got regular old spitfire die which spitfire die not a bad looking die but the uh, the glacial die, the textures of these seem like the texture of your armor seems different. They're really cool. They don't they don't really have a glow to them or like a glitter, but they definitely you can tell when people are wearing these dyes versus other ones. They usually you can see the texture on the armor. Uh, also, you can sell them, and I don't know if the price has changed at all. But like I got that glacial die, which is just like pretty much this color blue, basically right here, and it was worth eight gold. So if you're a gambler, you may be able to make a decent amount of money on selling these dot getting them. You have to shell out a bunch of gems to get them though, which is the problem. But you may be able to turn that into uh, into more money down the road. Also, at least as of the other day, uh, gems it was at like two gold, twenty silver for one hundred gems. So if there was ever a time where you wanted to take and you know buy gems to turn them into gold for yourself in the game this is the time to do it while the the ratio is very high unfortunately if you're trying to take your end game gold and turn it into gems you're kinda screwed because the price is ridiculous um, alright another thing and I may like I said I may have mentioned this or maybe I just mentioned this uh, in guild was this molten alliance mining pick for those of you who don't know, I believe it was the second Flame and Frost update. This the code for this uh, showed up in game, and nobody knew how to get it. And there was a lot of speculation about was it going to be random number generation? We have to get lucky at the Black Lion chest. Well, thankfully, that's not the case. You can just buy it. 800 gems, uh, and it mines any. I believe it doesn't have any level requirement, and you can mine any type of uh, mining nodes and it's unlimited use now while you can sit down and look at the math and say you know well if I were to spend 800 gems that costs about X amount of gold and then if I were to just take that gold and turn it into Ori Calcum mining picks I could buy X amount and you'll probably work out where buying this for 800 gems is actually less efficient for the amount of Ori Calcum mining picks you could do but it's only one pick and you know you could trade this to a lower level character if you wanted you know it's it, it's account bound when you buy it soul bound once you use it which is unfortunate I wish it was account bound like all the other mining picks and all the other gathering tools are so you could buy one and just transfer it to whichever character you're using uh, definitely pretty cool I don't know if you guys have if you have one if you've used it but the effect is awesome so I'll show you this And, uh, yeah, so here's this person here equipping it, but when you go to mine with it, the effect is pretty awesome. I need more grubs before I can fish. 
slay them and bring me their remains. So, definitely pretty cool, uh, I would say. <sighs> so, yeah, it's... The effect is awesome. If you really love cosmetic things, then I guess maybe this could be for you. Um, I know I personally picked one up because I love not ever having to carry multiple mining picks around. Uh, I can trade away my Black Lion mining picks to all my lower level characters. If I run them through, like, you know, world versus world jumping puzzles and want to go get or Calcum, I can give them my Black Lion ones, things like that. Um, it also makes me say, when are we going to get the permanent my, or harvesting sickle and the permanent axe? Because I would love to have a set of that so I can at least have one character where I don't have to worry about. Like, I can just run around and go uh, go out and mine and gather whatever I want. Um, so it's nice to see that actually showed up. And it's also nice to see that something as awesome as that isn't something where we have to gamble on with Black Lion keys to get. So... Very cool. Um, maybe it's only available till the 13th of May. So if you want to get it, get it. You know, within the next two weeks or three weeks here. Otherwise, you'll never be able to get it again, presumably. Uh, they may, you know, maybe later on we'll do something else. But for right now, it's the only way. All right, another little bit here. We've got, they're changing the times that they reset the World vs. World servers. And I think this is kind of a long time coming. But essentially, it's resetting at 3 p.m. Pacific uh, Daylight Time on Friday, which is um, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, if you're here in the States. But that is great, at least for me. If, I mean, I'm not as huge into World vs. World as I used to be, but the ability to like, get home from work on a Friday and then the game starts fresh, it's not resetting. I think it was, what, Wednesday or Thursday it would reset? and times were like 8 p.m. and this is better for you know the European players it's better for all the people here in North America you know it's also nice that you can know every Friday it's gonna reset I think maybe they should have done it with Saturday when all of the other weekly things reset like the guild bounties and everything all reset on Saturday maybe you should have just moved it to Saturday so everything resets on a Saturday but either way uh, next if you're trying to get, again, if you have friends that haven't played Guild Wars and they want to get it, 30% off uh, until April 28th. So uh, that's next Sunday. Uh, and also, again, as a reminder, the free trial weekend is also this weekend. So go check out like Tent on Hammer, Curse, a bunch of the other websites. I believe it's right on the main page here. Yeah, here we go. Trial weekend. Tent on Hammer, GameSpot, Twitch TV, MMORPG, Curse, PC Gamer, and Zam. Uh, also, if you were one of the people who played in the free trial in November, you're, it still saved your account, so you will be able to reactivate and presumably have all of the same stats and things you had from November, same characters, and you can pick up where you left off. Um, but I feel like if you tried it in November and you're waiting for the free trial to come back here now in April, um, why didn't you just buy the game? rather than waiting for another free trial. But I digress. Anyway. So, lots of, some interesting stuff coming out. Uh, let's see. Next, oh, there was a big question and answer session with Jonathan Sharp and John Peters that Guild Wars 2 Guru did. Because uh, they, they were originally planning on going to PAX East, which I believe was just this past weekend. And uh, or is coming up, and they won't be able to attend. And they, but they still managed to ask some questions to Jonathan Sharp and John Peters about the game, and a lot of things that a lot of us have been wondering about or have speculated about was was answered in this. And this is kind of going to be my content for the show here, is just discussing this with you guys and, and giving in my feedback because uh, I just, like I said, I didn't have time to really work on stuff I've been too sick. So the first question, which is one that a lot of us have been thinking, is do you foresee the addition of more skills for already existing weapons, or at the moment are you content with keeping it the way it is with only one set of skills per weapon? So I won't read you the entire uh, 
this response because both Jonathan and John both respond to it. But essentially, right now, they want to keep it focused on content. They said that it wouldn't be a bad idea in the future to have, you know, swappable skills for different weapons. But they said right now what they want to do as far as balancing goes is uh, revise all the traits. And I think that this is something that I'm sure a lot of us can agree, especially if you play characters or uh, professions that have their traits really split. Like if you were to look at Guardian, you'd see some traits in like the Zeal line or some traits in the Valor line. You're like, that should really be there and that should really be there. But I don't, whatever, it's fine. Uh, it's not too big of a deal, but I know for other classes, I think, you know, Engineer comes to mind for me, where depending on what you want to make your build, you're really stuck because you might have to go, you know, 25 points or 30 points into a tree to get one trait, but you don't really care about anything else in that trait line. And, you know, that, that's just not how it should be. You should try to keep things, you know, organized within, you know, reason, balance reasons, but... Uh, so that's pretty much what came out of that. Let's see. We feel that traits open up a lot of weapons uh, for a lot of the classes, and the reason for this is that some of the classes don't have as many viable options, maybe in PvE or specifically in dungeons or PvP or world versus world. And this is something that I'm sure a lot of people have seen. Uh, a lot of classes only have one or two viable builds. And if you remember from the beginning, they wanted to avoid this whole cookie cutter build thing where if you're not, you know, if you're a warrior, you have to run this build. If you're a guardian, you have to run this build. Or, you know, Mesmer, you have to run this build if you want to be effective in the game. And that's something they always wanted to stay away from. But it's not how it's happened at all. Uh, now, not to say that you can't come up. <laughs> yes, exactly. Joel says, ping build, please. Thank you very much. Uh, very Guild Wars 1 style, you know, make sure you're using a spear and a shield on your, you know, really if you're on any caster class from Guild Wars 1, but you, uh, I mean, I, you can still be creative in Guild, and by, you know, don't let anybody tell you otherwise, but whether, will you be as effective as somebody else who's using the same build that's like the current meta of, you know, whatever that profession is? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> and Joel follows that up with, Eek, you use that immediate kick, noob. Yes, that was, uh, Jexos, you joined the group here. But yes, uh, that was a problem, I'm sure a lot of you who are Guild Wars 1 players in any kind of, uh, higher level content, even in lower level content, but in any kind of higher level content, dungeons, hard mode, Specifically, if you're trying to do like Hall of Heroes, I remember that from when Hall of Heroes was really, you know, full of people probably five years ago. If you weren't running like X build, it was like switch to this, or, you know, switch your armor set to this armor set and this weapon set, or you're out, basically. Um, they didn't really care if you liked it or how it worked for you or how it felt for you. It was basically this way or not. And I'm seeing a lot of comments here in our chat are kind of reflecting that as well. Uh, lots of you have to go, uh, yeah, ping armor, ping weapon, etc. So I I kind of agree with that. I feel like trait revision, folk, don't go about adding new stuff when your current game is kind of, I mean, it's good. Let's not, you know, demean what ArenaNet has done. The game is good and it works well. But I would like to see more variability in the builds out there, and I feel a revision and adjustment of traits, which they have been doing on a small scale per profession, you know, each kind of build, there's like a little tweak to this one and a little tweak to that one. And poor rangers, God, give them something, please. Uh, Jolinar says, someone in guild chat the other day said someone asked for an armor ping before a COF run. Hmm. Anyway, but yes, fix the game, make the traits more, make some, like, as we all know, there's certain traits that you would be hard pressed to try to find a build that would use that trait. Because you look at that and you're like, this is an absolutely useless trait, no one's going to use this. Why would I take that when I could clearly take this other one or one of these three other ones? 
So, uh, unless you're very creative, which kudos to you if you are. Uh, so let's continue on with some of the questions. Another one that people, and myself included, do you know if there are any plans to add new weapon types to the game in the future? Be it a distant update or even an expansion, or is this something you plan to avoid? And the answer, short answer is yes. They do plan on adding additional weapons to the game. Uh, and a lot of people, and they say it, on the forums have picked this up, and I think you know a lot of us have been saying this from the beginning, the way that the skills are tied, there's a set number of skills tied to a weapon, great, oh, that's one of the great things about Guild Wars 2, is adding in new weapons won't be as big of a deal, because you'll be able to be like, okay, well, we just need to balance that weapon, and then add it in, and we, but then that previous comment kind of got me thinking about that, if you add in a new weapon, now you're going to have to add in a whole slew of new traits to then make that weapon useful. Because if you add in a brand new weapon, like let's say you add in a scythe, like a lot of people are saying. Because a lot of people love dervish, a lot of people love scythes, and I couldn't agree more. Well, now you have to come up with a whole new set of traits that are specific to scythes for whatever the classes are that have access to that. Which then it comes, do we remove traits? Do they add in more traits and keep that same, you know, just kind of adjust it? Like, let's say they add in, on a given trait line, two more per tier. You know, does that mean you have to take out two of the existing ones? Do you just make it so that, you know, you have, instead of the first six traits, it's the first eight traits for the, the you know, the, the uh, God, what is it, the adept tier, I think it is, is the first tier. Master, grandmaster. Uh, I see some people in the chat mentioning adding new classes. I wouldn't be opposed to that, but as I've made, you know, I've made my case on this in the past, adding a whole new class is a lot more balancing issues than adding new weapons to the game. My personal opinion, and don't get me wrong, I'd love to see new classes and something fresh. Uh, new races, I've always said, I feel are a very, something that doesn't really affect the game at all, because it doesn't affect the way you play the game. It only affects, you know, what your racial armor, racial weapons look like, and a couple of racial skills, which if you're only adding four to five skills new to the game, it should be easy balancing. It's just lore and, uh, and story. But new classes, my other thing, and this wasn't going to be my question of the week, but I'm going to kind of make this, I'm going to have two this week, and the other one will come later. Here's one. A lot of people are saying they think you should add another class or classes, and... I pose to you for, you know what, this one's going to be worth two gold, because this is a good question, I'd love to see what people say. Uh, what do you think the new class could be? Uh, class or classes, I would say add at most two more classes um, would be kind of my max, I would say, or at least one to add another, a third, let's go with one. One more, because in my mind, you should have at least three of each, you know, armor tier. You have light, medium, heavy, and you have 3-3-2. Three, three, well, I think it should be 3-3-3. Three, three, three. But even so, if it's not a heavy armor class, my problem with that is a lo the, they've gone to pretty great lengths to make all of the current amount of classes, the eight classes, or professions rather, very distinctly different from one another. And they all have their kind of individual mechanic. And what could they add to the game as a new class that fundamentally, while both skills, types of skills, and kind of the individual mechanic is so different from what they already have that it doesn't feel like one of the other classes. And I'm not saying that it's impossible to do, but I feel like the eight classes they have have really covered most of the typical fantasy kind of typical class you know profession stereotypes out there you've got your heavy armor you got your you know your illusionist type person you have your necromancer you have your ranger with their pets an engineer i feel was kind of out of left field that's something that really wasn't in most fantasy games especially because you know the types of armor and weapons that they use so what could they add that's completely different Hosts at chroniclesoteria.com or comment on the YouTube after this video comes out. 
uh, what you think would be uh, the best new class for Guild Wars 2. And, and then I also want an explanation of why you think that that would be good. And again, you have to think about this from ArenaNet's perspective and the player perspective. If you add a new class that has nothing different or is very similar to another class, if someone's already familiar with the eight classes, might why would they want to play that ninth class uh, if it's so similar? They might be like, oh, I already have a guy that's level 15, level 50 of that class, and this one's pretty much the same. I don't see the point in starting over. So again, kind of a little bit of a random myself. But uh, please, I'd love to hear your feedback. And who knows, maybe we can try to push it to ArenaNet. I'm not saying that I have that kind of power, because I clearly don't. But uh, maybe if we get enough people behind it, and we can get it going on the forums, and hell, at the very least, maybe we can get a April Fool's joke next year, like we did with the Commando and the Minstrel a few years back, and they'll make up a fake one for us. So, But anyway, back to the actual question, or comment, I guess. Uh, yes, they decided adding new weapons is easy, and they said, uh, for instance, you can just give one of the classes a new weapon, and all of a sudden they have a complete new way to play that class that interacts with the utilities, the heals, the elites, and the profession abilities, but it's one of those things that we want to wait on until the time is right, and again, like I said, I feel this is a good call on ArenaNet's behalf, because you should wait until your game is at its best before you start adding radical new changes to it. Um, let me, I lost my place. Uh, they want to wait till the time is right. We still feel there's some work to be done in the classes, getting them up to par. And one of the things they, they mentioned here is it's probably more likely to start to have classes be have access to weapons that are already in the game. Like give a warrior, I don't know, a short bow or something like that. A weapon that's already in the game and an established game item in the game and give certain classes access to new weapons, but not really new. Like I like I've said, I think a thief should have a rifle and have like a sniper type class. And these kinds of things will probably happen before they go and add new weapons because they don't want to add new weapons for just the sake of doing it. They want them to be, you know, utilized well and then like I said, you have to balance traits. And then you also have to think about it as balancing it for PvP, PvE, and world versus world. So that's a lot of work to add a whole new weapon, but maybe adding, giving you know a class access to a different weapon that's already in the game saves them a lot of that steps already. Uh, and I'm seeing Elementalist plus Great Sword, Guardian dual wielding swords. I've said that Mesmer should be able to dual wield pistols. I think a class or multiple classes should be able to use dual wielded scepters. I don't see why freaking Hodgins can do it in Ascalonian Catacombs, but nobody else can do it. Um, you know, I think that Engineer should have Hammer or Mace, some sort of melee weapon. Um, I think Offhand Scepter would also be a cool weapon, for at least for Guardians, if not for several other classes. I'm not going to touch dual wielding shields because, while it sounds fun, uh, I think it's kind of silly. But, you know, uh, I don't think double... I feel like certain weapons clearly fit the offhand better, like focus, and, like, I, I don't see the point of, like, double Warhorn. I feel like that's kind of weird. Like, how much help are you going to really need to call for? Actually, I guess if you're wielding dual Warhorns, you have really no offense, so you probably will need to call for help. So maybe having two would just make it that much better. Um... But yes, I feel there's definitely, uh, <laughs> double warhorn would blow, but um, thank you, Brahms, for that. Um, yes, I think rifle on the thief, I think, you know, an engineer with a hammer fits, a hammer and shield fits, you know, I mean, if you're going to be kind of crafting and all steampunky, maybe you want to, you know... You want to use a mace and slap on stuff and hammer away. I mean, there's the one mace that looks like a wrench. Fits engineer if you want to use a two-handed hammer. Uh, engineer and torch also makes sense because, I mean, you could be heating stuff up and then, you know, if you're forging, uh, etc. I This could go on forever, so I'm going to leave this one alone. But 
like I said, I feel you focus, get the traits working the way they should, and then add new, give some classes access to other weapons that are already in the game. Not to, you know, not don't go crazy with it. Don't just give people weapons to give them weapons. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> um, also, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to do, like, a trial weekend. Like, they used to do this a lot with, kind of, with Guild Wars 1, and when they were releasing new classes, or, like, a new expansion was coming out. We'd get, like, a month or so, or a couple weeks before it would come out, we'd get a trial, and we could try out the new classes and things like that. I don't think it would be a bad idea if, like, it's kind of like a beta weekend. Like, this is new weapon beta weekend. And, you know, this is the weekend we, we decide that, you know, these classes get access to these weapons. And we just try it out for a weekend. And it's a fun, good time. And if it doesn't work, then, okay, well, that clearly didn't work. Let's try to switch it up. Uh, let's see. They talk a lot. The next piece is about class balance. And the question was, I'm not going to, I'll just kind of jump around on this, but are you happy with each class's ability to avoid damage, and do you take the class's ability to pull aggro into consideration when working on methods of damage negation? Are there any classes that you feel need more or less work in this respect? And basically what they say is every class needs work in a little bit of all the different aspects, because certain classes uh, you might see be do really well in let's say a dungeon or in general PvE like let's say a guardian for instance um, and I just use guardian because that's something that's kinda near and dear to my personal heart but you know you can tank pretty well in a dungeon but that same build uh, I mean at least the build that I use is kinda different in that it, it can kinda work alright in world versus world and in PvP but with other classes, you can have like a really good PvP build, but then you take that to PvE or World vs. World and it just doesn't work. And that's why they're saying they kind of need to focus on that, because you're getting like a stigma built around certain classes, where like, and that's actually like the next thing where you're seeing like people like, oh, looking for Fractals of the Mist level X, no thieves, no elementalists. And, you know, or, like, Guardian, please, for this. And, you know, the whole point of Arena Net's no healer, no tank, no DPS thing was so that you wouldn't kind of have this, no Holy Trinity deal, and that's not really the case. People are still doing it anyway. But, uh, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily true. I feel like, yes, there are some classes are better that, uh, yeah, three guardian, three warriors, one guardian, one mesmer for every dungeon, please. Yeah, exactly. Uh, again, just reading stuff from, from the chat here. But that's their kind of goal, because this is what they said from the beginning, is they want to balance the classes so that you'll have, be able to use, you know, you can use your same class in PvE, P, you know, PvP, world versus world, dungeons, and you just have to switch up your build, which also segued into another thing that someone mentioned, like, what about multiple... It sucks that if you want people to experiment and try out other builds and to see what they like and try to, you know, play around with things, it costs them gold to do so. So they really might find a build that they like and never experiment anywhere else because it costs them money to do so. And they might not want to change up their build from when they go from PvE to World versus World because then they have to reset all their skills, they may need to buy a whole new set of armor. So they did talk about possibly having like you have like a world versus world build. Build? Sorry, this border I'm still getting used to where my hands go. Uh, you know, you have like a build for world versus world, a build for PvE, a build, you know, in PvP you can switch it up. And I think that would be a good idea. That would at least save some of the switching uh or, you know, if we had multiple builds, it would also be good. But, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think adding the ability to have a world versus world build in a PvP, or, or in a PvE build, would be good? Or is that kind of a waste of time and resources building, you know, having that set up? Um, I don't know. 
let me know what you think in the chat now in the comments below I I really don't know and really have an opinion on that I don't play world versus world enough to really feel like it's uh, it's necessary but Everybody here seems to think it's a good idea here in the chat. So those of you listening at home and things, let me know what you think. Uh, let's see. Next piece was due to high material prices, it's currently next to impossible to actually make profit through crafting. Is this something being looked at? Or was crafting always meant to be a means for things you uh, like creating legendaries rather than turning a profit? And it says, the short answer is that we do want it, uh, it to be something you can do. Because I'm sure any of you who craft know that you can't make any money crafting. It's pretty much not an option. Uh, you, you can make a little money here and there. But honestly, it's cheaper to just go buy things. Especially with the, uh, the way the market prices are with the reduction in, in ectos and, and gold prices because things keep dropping due to the the world events but what we're trying to balance there though is what, uh, is that we want it to be a mode of progression we want you to do some profits with it but the big thing is that's where you get all your cool stuff from we want people to have different ways where they acquire really cool things in the game we want to make sure that like legendaries that's something you can get there but you can get it through other ga uh, game types as well one of the things that we also keep in mind which is talking to our economists with global markets sometimes things can be shifted and adjusted to watch for things to watch for exploits which is why we're trying to keep a tight rein on that stuff to not let the crafting stuff start to uh, start to turn too much profit so that it blows the economy out of the water um, yeah and as some people are saying here in the chat and I agree a lot of people end up using the crafting more for leveling purposes than anything, which is usually what I use it for. Um, I don't think I have crafted since, like, you know, when I didn't know any better. Uh, but it's cheaper for me. I, like, every five levels as I'm leveling a character, I just buy green armor of whatever that armor type is. In the beginning, where we, you know, didn't have a ton of characters at level 80 in the beginning and you were slowly leveling yourself up, over that period of time, yeah, you know, you might be using what armor you found, you know, rather than transmuting to stuff you like and using that the whole way through. Which really wishes, makes me wish that I took, like, screenshots every time I changed my armor so I could show, like, a progression of my character from level 1 all the way through level 80 of all the changes in my armor that I've done, which I thought would be really cool, but I didn't think of it till way later. Because like now, like I said, I level up five levels, I just buy a new set of armor, and I don't care what it looks like. Or if I know I'm going to get an armor set that I really like and that's what I want, I'll just transmute it every five levels, or every ten levels, whatever it is. Uh, so, I feel crafting is good if you want to get your exotics and you don't want to get anything specific. Like once you hit level 80 and you're like, oh, I want exotic gear, well, let me go craft it. Or, you know, if you like dungeons, you just do it that way. It doesn't cost you anything. You get money from doing it that way. Uh, so, I don't know. I feel like crafting could use some tweaks. But I feel like that's not really a hard-pressed issue in the game. So, uh, I've never really thought to myself and complained, well, I'm not making enough money on my crafting. So... I mean, the only way you could kind of make money was when you could trade in commendations and you could craft jewel craft items, throw them in the Mystic Forge, and then use your commendations to buy black line keys or things like that. Um, here's a good question. Can we expect to see any new mechanics added to the world bosses in the future? Currently, many of them simply soak up damage, which pleases more casual players, but doesn't do much for players looking for a challenge. Can't agree more on this one. And first response is, Jonathan just laughs. <laughs> and then next response we get is, I think it was always our intention that these giant world bosses would kind of uh, define the zones they are in. That it would feel a little more like old school open raids. They capture some of these elements, but they don't capture all of them. This is a difficult problem to solve because we couldn't know how people were going. 
make sense, but all right. I think I've told this before, but if we took everyone in the company and all we did was test for 10 years, that would be the equivalent of four hours on live. And so it's hard to know until we have metrics and data of how these fights are played out and empirical evidence of how they are playing out. When there's millions of people playing them, it's hard for us to estimate how these things are going to play. We learn a lot about that. We want to make them cooler. We want to make them be more both defining as fights, but also defining as how they change the zone and how they make you feel like this is a living world. The things we talked about at some point, but you don't know when this is going to happen, but you know when you defeat the Shatterer, what happens to the map when you don't defeat him, which you does... Jesus, could he speak in a longer sentence? Holy crap. I'm sorry. This is very hard to read. Um, what happens... Oh my god, I'd give up. Let's skip ahead a little bit. This is an area where we are doing work, but this is work that is like uh, as a lead time. You start working on it, and there's all these things that have to happen for it to become a reality for us to say, like, yes, we're going to see new mechanics in the world in the future. People are going to be like, oh, awesome, we're going to see them in May, but that's not how development works, especially on a game this big this many moving parts and interacting pieces. Anyway, you look at it, we talked about the maturation of a player base, things that might be challenging at ship, uh, are not challenging this far into the game. Uh, let's pretend hypothetically there was this boon called stability. We thought it was going to be awesome if, hey, you know what we just thought of? We now have stacking and we can make stability stack. And then what happens is instead of just blocking CCs every time you get hit with stability, you would lose a stack of it. Okay, wow, this is going to give stability so much more play in the game. How Now this is a discussion that we've had at some point. There are benefits to it and drawbacks to it. There's also every creature that uses stability. How would we have to rebalance how many stacks they're putting on themselves and how are players working and how is this going to be affected in world versus world. Some discussions like that can come and go. Uh, because of what they create, and sometimes they can be vis visited and stuff like that. But, you know, it's just an idea of something... Okay, that was... I don't really get any useful content out of that, other than I don't really think they know how to manage that at this point. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, exactly. Joel brings up a good point. Has the dragon ever not been defeated? Not to my knowledge. Uh because there's usually so many people there and all they do is soak up damage. I don't believe that... I feel like they should at this point... I get it, you know, at the beginning, dragons were a lot different at launch of the game as they are here now, seven months into the game. But a lot of people are playing them. The rewards are good, so people are constantly playing them. Uh, scaling them up to, you know, afford mass amounts of players or at least increase the scaling past whatever it's up to, 50 players now, I think. Increase the scaling so that it'll accurately scale up to maybe 100 players, 200 players. Uh, I mean, you don't have to, if it, if you don't go up to 200, you know, you can have it set to scale to 200 players, but if only 50 players show up, then it doesn't really matter. But if 200 players show up, then at least you're accurately scaled. I don't know, I think it needs some work, but it sounds like they're working on it, but it's not their number one priority. Uh, currently, the only re this is a good one. Currently, the only way for pugs to reliably find groups is to use forums and outside websites. Are you guys actively working on the looking for group system, Guild Wars 2, or is this something currently, or is this something even currently on your radar? Short answer is yes. It's very much on our radar, and it's actually something we have people looking at right now. The intention is to make a single system that we want to use across all game types. We want to do something where basically once you learn one uh, you learn for one specific type like looking for a dungeon help if you jump to the PvP lobby you can use the exact same system there. So that I get uh, so that I get at so that I get good at the system I learn how to use it, learn how to filter with it, etc. Yes, so that would be a good idea. Uh, because Guild Wars 2 looking for group, as most of you know, is probably the best way to find um, to find anybody looking to, if you're looking for to do a dungeon or anything, 
and that's an outside website and if this is something that Guild Wars had that website wouldn't even be necessary and you'd probably have a lot more reliable trying rather than just spamming Lions Arch map chat trying to find people to go do things with you um okay what do you feel is currently the biggest issue with class balance in PvE uh, there's a few things. One of the big things in dungeons right now is that obviously people know that warriors and guardians are really good. We know that rangers are sometimes seen as very weak of the liability that is pet, that is the pet, so right now we're actually working on a lot of stuff to bring the ranger up and get them on the same page to be able to compete with other guys who are often taken into the dungeons. Again, like I've said from, for months, please make rangers more viable than they currently are. We're also looking at all the different classes to make sure they have a role that they can fill. This goes back to some of the earlier questions. If you've got eight classes in five slots, somebody's going to get picked more often than the others. That's something we want to make sure that we don't take away uh, some of the power that all the classes have and that they enjoy these top spots. But we want to give everyone a chance to be in there. We want to make sure that the ranger is getting a lot of help to pets and spirits and utilities. We want to get them back up there, thieves as well. Oh, wow. Thieves as well. That's nice. Uh, one of the biggest issues with balance in PvE is the skill cap. We see there are certain things that as soon as we try to balance, uh, try and balance for certain thing, we can't change. One thing we could do, we could just make creatures do more stuff and more difficult stuff. And what would happen is, yeah. So I think one of the things is that the warrior and garden are pretty straightforward professions, and creatures tend to be more straightforward for players to fight. So warrior and guardian tools are straightforward tools that work well towards these more straightforward creatures. We could just make our creatures less straightforward and that would actually kind of solve some of these problems. But if we create a new problem for players that are not good at dealing with these less straightforward situations, we would have a lot harder time balancing our encounters if we made our creatures that way. There's kind of a fine line that we have to walk of encounters need to be understandable to a large variety of players but at the same time uh, same time understandable uh, in understandable encounters are probably more straightforward for classes with more straightforward tools to deal with uh, those encounters and are generally going to be more effective in those areas another overarching thing we can talk about real fast is that we have a lot of class balances we tried as we said earlier we try to keep it as homogenous as possible Try to make sure that PvE numbers match the PvP and the World B World numbers so that you can kind of have some of the familiarity with everything. As people are learning the game and are really starting to push the min-maxing for some of these things, we're starting to split skills more and more. So, yada yada yada. Uh, uh, Brahm says a group join system with ratings would be so so awesome. I agree. Um, that would be, it would also, you know, if you're a, like a jerk who constantly kicks people, uh, yells at people for being noobs and things like that, and if you have a rating system, well, that might show you that you don't want to go play dungeons with that person. And then that also showed them that if I'm an a complete asshole to everybody that I play with, well, no one's going to want to play with me. And, you know, problem solved. And maybe those ratings stay there for a month. And then that way, you know, at the end of the month, or they slowly tick down over the course of the month, and, you know, that would be nice. So that way, you know, it really makes you think about how you act, and since ArenaNet's all about community, well, I mean, that'll kind of take those people out of the community, but it'll help foster a better community in-game. So that's something that I think should definitely be taken care of and should be done. So, good idea, Brahms. And, it, yes, it would be nice to see, uh, what's it called, uh, some love for both rangers and thieves. I like thieves the way they are currently. They have some cool stuff going on, but I wouldn't mind seeing uh, a little bit extra love. And definitely, I want to love ranger so much. So, please give us a reason to do so. Um, but, yeah, that's... That's I think that's pretty much it for what I have. Um, like I said, Casey should be back next week, so we should be back on track for uh, some lore and things like that. If you're in the guild, um, we're also going to 
be working on our forums to try to tweak them to make them a little more user friendly uh, a little bit kind of prettier and nicer to look at uh, we're also consolidating things so it's a little less confusing as well so uh, we got a lot of good stuff coming from COT the guild so uh, if you're not a member and you would like to join please check out our forums in the public thing there's a friends and family referral um, but anyway well, that's another story so uh, I don't want to extend this too much more but let me add my second question of the week aside from the one earlier about the pre uh, the new profession so my second question is uh, not necessarily Guild Wars related but you can apply it to Guild Wars if you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, uh, wife, husband, what have you, friend even, and you're trying to get them to play video games, and they don't really play video games at this current point, how do you go about doing it? What do you do? Do you... This is kind of... And I mean, this is a personal thing to me, but like, let's say you want to get them to play Guild Wars, but they've never played a computer game. Do you start them off with computer games? Do you start them off with something simple like a console game? Do you go old school and go like 8-bit NES where you only have two buttons and a D-pad? But then it's like, well, what if they're, you know, they only, this is too low-tech graphics for them, and they'd rather play something that looks nicer, but then you have two thumbsticks and a bunch of buttons. What do you do? Do you start them with, you know, an easier game? Do you start them with your favorite game? Because, I mean, let's say you start them with your favorite game, and they don't like your favorite game. Well, okay, they don't like your favorite game. Well, now you're a little bit hurt, because that's your favorite game, and they don't like it. Do you try to teach them with other games entirely? And then that way, if they don't like any of the other ones, you can be like, okay, okay. You don't like these games, but this is my absolute favorite game. So maybe if you try this one, you'll like this one. Do you do... But then you also have the dilemma of, like, some of the really great games that get people really into them are single-player games. And some of the, you know, but there's a ton of fun multiplayer games. How do you go about doing it? Where do you start? What console system, you know, how do you do it? Give me your best, uh, your best way to go about that. Hosts at ChroniclesLateria.com. Comments on the YouTube uh, page as well. So, uh, again, one, actually this one I'll also do. I'm going to do two gold for both of the questions today because I'm feeling generous. So two gold to the best answer for that one as well. Um, it's just, uh, it's something near and dear to me personally because I've been trying to get my wife into video games. And I have a plethora of games from all different genres and all different uh, console generations going from 8-bit Nintendo all the way up through modern modern consoles and Guild Wars. And while I'd love for her to play Guild Wars 2, I don't know if that's really the best way to start her off. Maybe I should start her off with something a little bit easier. I mean, then you also got to figure out if you want them to play computer games, what if they don't have a computer that can handle the game you want them to play? Do you let them use your computer, but then you can't play with them? Ah, you know, craziness. Oh, love good. Let's hear your question of the week from me. I'm waiting. You're you're delaying everyone. The suspense is killing everyone here. Love good. <laughs> Will I come to COE after podcast? Yeah, I, I guess I could. I guess I could do that. Um. Give me a break to go get some water. But yeah, I could do that. Um, so, alright. But again, two questions of the week are what would you, what and why, what's the reasoning behind your new, uh, a new, one new class to add to Guild Wars 2? Uh, and I mean, the other question is, how do you get your significant other or your friend or who, however else you want to try to get them to play games, what's the best way to do it? Where do you start? 
etc. Love good. Don't tell me I can only take a quick break only. I'll do what I want. But I'll make it quick. Or at least attempt anyway. So anyway guys, before this gets too dry, uh, drawn out here, um, make sure you get back to me about the questions. Uh, yeah. So for Chronicles of Tyria, episode number 43, uh, I am Lagwin by myself. <laughs> and I will see you next time.